of all the poetry ever written, the 23rd Psalm is one of the most well-known. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. In the face of evil, uh, we always have a choice. We can choose to be afraid, or we can choose to be dangerous. Now, growing up in Christchurch, uh, I always wanted to be a superhero. I worshipped <laughs> Batman, uh, Zorro, the Bionic Man, and I was always with a gun in one hand and a sword in the other. Uh, when I grew up, I went to Canterbury University and ultimately uh, overseas completed a master's degree focusing on issues surrounding poverty and injustice. I ended up joining the New Zealand Police and uh, it was some years later while working as a detective in Christchurch that I learned about an American organisation that used the skills of investigators to gather evidence that could then be used to set people free from slavery. Thinking this was the perfect job for a superhero, I applied for a full-time position and uh, ultimately my wife and I relocated to the United States. I was then deployed on my first mission and it was then that I met a young girl named Maria. At, the, at an age of 12, uh, Maria was approached by a group of men who promised her a job in a neighboring country where she could earn, she was told, enough money to send home and support her entire family. With the blessing of her family, Maria went with those men. She crossed the border only to discover that she was not taken to a clothing factory, but instead to a brothel where she was raped and brutalized and told that she had a debt to pay off and that she was not free to leave until she had paid off that debt in full, plus interest. First opportunity Maria got, she escaped. She uh, ran down the road, she burst through the doors of the local police station. She told them exactly what had happened. The local police took her straight back to the brothel. They provided protection for the criminals working there. They got a lot of money uh, from their business and free girls whenever they wanted them. When I met Maria, she was nearly 16 years old and uh, she was still in that brothel and she had absolutely no recourse to justice. I had paid to have sex with Maria. I'd spoken to the brothel manager. Uh, he told me in great detail what she was good at, how long I could have and how much it would cost. What he didn't know was that I was wearing a covert camera and was recording our entire conversation. And in doing so, had gathered enough evidence to send him to jail for a very long time. So my job done, I was eager to get out of there as soon as I could because I was terrified. I was terrified for three reasons. Firstly, I was afraid of my own frail humanity. I was a married man in a brothel. I did not want to say or do anything to betray my wife. Uh, secondly, I was afraid of the bad guys with guns. I was there by myself. If they found the camera I was wearing, I probably would not make it out of there in one piece. And thirdly, I was afraid of the, the huge evil empire that lay behind this industry called sex trafficking, and I perceived that I was going behind enemy lines. So for all those reasons, I made an excuse. I said, I've got to go and get some more money. I headed to the door uh, in an effort to escape. Maria, however, intercepted me. She was also terrified that she would be punished if she didn't satisfy the customer. So she grabbed me and pulled me onto the dance floor and she pulled me into herself just to let me know that she was mine to consume whenever I was ready. Uh, I was even more terrified uh, at that point and um, uh, I didn't know what to do. Um, with uh, standing awkwardly on this brothel dance floor with the a 15-year-old girl doing her best to seduce me and the brothel manager now watching me very carefully. I'm not ashamed to say that I silently prayed that I would make it out of there in one piece. And this doesn't happen to me very often, but in that moment I had, for want of a better word, an epiphany. And suddenly everything changed. Because I suddenly saw Maria not as a threat to my personal purity or professionalism, but as a little girl as a little girl who had been completely devoured by evil. And I was filled with this overwhelming sense of hatred, an all-consuming hatred for the forces of evil that had conspired to bring her to that place, and anger, all-consuming anger at our indifferent world, 
that so allows its children to be sold as sex toys. And it just hit me that I had just gathered enough evidence to facilitate the arrest and prosecution of every criminal in that place, and that in fact, if anyone was dangerous, it was actually me. If anyone needed to fear, it was the criminals making a profit from the rape of the innocent. I did manage to extricate myself from that situation and ultimately left that brothel, but I left armed with a lot more courage and a lot more compassion than I had when I entered. I ultimately worked in more than 12 countries uh, over a four-year period, posing as a pedophile, a sex tourist, a sex tour operator, whatever was necessary to get in some really dark places. And what I discovered in those dark places shocked me. I learned that there are more people in slavery today than any other time in human history. And the fastest growing form of slavery is this thing called human trafficking. Human trafficking is the fastest growing international crime and the largest source of income for organized crime, uh, earning criminal groups more than 32 billion US dollars annually. The huge majority of victims who are being sold into this industry are poor and come from the poorest countries and poorest communities on earth. And currently less than 0.5 of a percent of all victims are ever rescued and ever participate in any kind of judicial procedure, which basically represents an appalling failure on behalf of our global community to address this evil called modern day slavery. It wasn't just the, the massive nature of this industry though that shocked me, it was also the nature of it. My second deployment was to a village in Southeast Asia where uh, upon arrival I was led uh, by one pimp to a series of alleyways to a house that was one of many being used as a brothel. And uh, an adult male walked into the room with two 14-year-old girls and he said, for 30 US dollars, you can have these girls for one hour. Having seen the intelligence on that village, I said, nah, I'm looking for something a bit different. And at that point he said, oh, wait, wait, wait. He came back into the room a few moments later and uh, he had two six-year-old girls. And they had pigtails in their hair and teddy bears on their shirt. And he said, for 30 US dollars, you can have these girls and do whatever you want for one hour. I said, fantastic, have you got any more girls like this? And he said, yes, I do. And over the next three weeks, he introduced me to more than 40 children between the ages of five and 12 who were being sold every day in that village to men from Australia, United States, Canada, Europe, UK, and New Zealand. We ultimately arranged uh, to have a sex party. I said, I've got these clients, they're wealthy, they'd love girls like this, and we had a, a central uh, predetermined location. And on that date, they brought these children to that location, and my busload of, of uh, sex tourist clients arrived, the doors opened. But much to the horror of the criminals, a team of armed police officers acting on the information we'd given them uh, raided that place, uh, rescued many of those children. Uh, the youngest child I carried out of a brothel that day was five years old. Equally importantly, 10 perpetrators were sentenced to imprisonment for up to 20 years, which was a groundbreaking sentence in that part of the world. And I discovered that combating this thing called human trafficking is comparatively easy. Because every day around the world, as we sit here, men are walking through the doors of brothels, customers, and they get to see the floor plan. They get to see who's working there. They get to see where the profits are going. And if that customer is me or one of our team, they are incredibly vulnerable because like any business, they can't make a profit without selling uh, the products. They can't make a profit without the customer. And unlike guns and drugs, women and children can talk. I went to another brothel uh, the size of a small factory where about 100 women from seven different nations were all being held captive. And uh, ultimately, after paying for uh, sex with one of the, child, uh, one of the young women, uh, she was about 18 years old, in the privacy of the bedroom, I then had to make up an excuse as to uh, why we weren't actually going to have sex. Sometimes I'd say, I'm from New Zealand, we don't have sex. <laughs> <laughs> we are a very small nation. But more often, I'd just say, look, I've, I've just broken up with my girlfriend. I'm really upset. I just want to talk to someone. Where are you from? 
And how long have you been here? And when are you going home? And what do you mean you can't go home? And who do you have to pay this debt to? And, and who owns this place? And in doing so, gathered really damning, compelling evidence. Ultimately, I returned to that brothel over three nights and throat, spoke to three separate women. And each of them, at the end of the evening, once they realized this strange little man from New Zealand was a little bit more compassionate than their normal customer, they begged and they wept and they held my hand and said, please don't leave me here, please come back. We couldn't take that evidence to the local police because they were complicit, they were corrupt. We had to go to a completely different city. But they did raid that brothel and 99 women were rescued and all of them were successfully repatriated to their countries and to their families. <clears throat> So this work was incredibly rewarding uh, when it went well, but sometimes it didn't go well. Sometimes between leaving the police station and driving to the target, a corrupt official made a phone call, uh, and I would arrive at the destination only to find that those women and children that I had met uh, were gone. Maria is one such case. Uh, she was never rescued, and I did not know what to do with that. I would get back on a, fl a plane and, and fly home, uh, ultimately knowing that I had failed. And that because I had failed, there was a child or a young woman still being raped for profit every day. So I became all the more determined never to fail. And I became completely uh, intense and all-consumed and ultimately completely burned out by this world of trafficking. I was on my very last deployment. Uh, I'd paid for the time of a 29-year-old woman from the Ukraine. Uh, she'd uh, been trafficked, but she'd paid off her debt and she was just making some money for herself. I recorded her story, and then I said, look, I don't want sex, I just want a massage. In the course of that massage, I was morally compromised, and I betrayed my wife. I betrayed my marriage vows. I betrayed the organization I was working for. I betrayed my mission and everything I believed in. And uh, I couldn't believe it had happened. I'd started to believe, I think, that I was Superman. Uh, I came back to my hotel room, I shut the door, and I collapsed and, and sobbed. Ultimately, my wife and I came back to New Zealand. We tried for two years to hold our marriage together, but we, we failed, and today we are divorced. And I discovered that I was not a superhero. I was just uh, a man. When your marriage falls apart uh, in the New Zealand police, I was back in the police by that point, they send you to a psychologist. And uh, I went to see the psychologist, and he said, I suggest you write down your thoughts. It'll be very cathartic. And I got a bit carried away, and um, it became a book. <laughs> uh, God in a brothel. And it was in writing this book that I realized that I had learned a lot about how to do this work well, but also how not to do it. And I was able to identify some best practices that must be followed to safeguard and protect the investigators doing this work and their families. But the really exciting thing I discovered was that you don't have to be a superhero to conquer evil. You only have to be human. Because in our, in our humanity, we have choice. And in that choice, we are powerful beyond measure. The most dangerous force for good in the world today is a person who recognizes that in the face of any evil, no matter how big or small, we have the ability to choose. I initially thought that my humanity was a weakness, indeed, that my humanity was a, a complete catastrophe. Uh, but I came to see that it was actually in my humanity and in my freedom to choose that I was more powerful than any Superman. So I chose to receive forgiveness. I chose to forgive myself. And I chose to be publicly honest about my own moral failure because living in shame is a choice. I chose to build and learn from my failures and mistakes, both personal and professional, because, again, living in fear is a choice. I now work for an organization called Invader, and our goal is to rescue victims of sex trafficking, to facilitate the prosecution of the perpetrators, and to empower local communities so they can do this work themselves. Uh, since uh, the beginning of the year, we have rescued 38 uh, women and children and facilitated the arrest of 16 uh, perpetrators. Uh, just um, last uh, month, our team, actually, sorry, last week, our team was in southern Thailand, 
and uh, we were able to rescue four 14-year-old girls who had been trafficked from Burma to a brothel. Uh, two of the girls were still virgins. They had just arrived, and they were due to be raped the following day, and our team was able to lead them to safety. In the next 10 years, we aim to impact more than 200,000 women and children. We live in a global community that is getting smaller and smaller by the day. If we who have the ability to act do not act, then our children's children will grow up in a world where slavery is in every community and on every street corner. Bishop Desmond Tutu said that if we remain neutral, indifferent, or inactive in the face of injustice, we have already chosen. We have already chosen to side with the oppressor. So today, in the face of whatever obstacles, whatever injustices you are facing in your own lives, and also in the face of this huge evil industry called sex trafficking, I invite you today to choose to be dangerous. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.